And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs> so, uh, Robert, tell us where you're from. We'll forgive you for that. <laughs> Filipino people in Jersey City. There's the Red Ribbon Bakery there, and all kinds of stores and restaurants. I feel like I'm in Hawaii when I'm in Jersey City. <laughs> no, but uh, then this is your mother in law? My mother in law, Francis, my wife, Marjorie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they speak uh, the Tagalog or the other? The Tagalog. Alright, that's like Terry's dad, I believe, right? Very good. Well, my wife is half Filipino. The better half, I think. I'm not sure. I don't know. Her mother would get, punch me right now if she were here. <laughs> but uh, good to have you here again. We used to say that the, uh, New Jersey is the garden state, right? But where I was from, Jersey City, the garbage state. That's what I used to say. <laughs> yeah, flushing the toilet, though, we say. <laughs> but um, good place to be from. We <laughs> say I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> Anyway, we're in Acts chapter 13, if you turn there. We've been going through the book of Acts and looking at the New Testament church. You know what I want to do first? I want to read a scripture from each of the gospel records, because tonight we're beginning a, uh, a new era here in the New Testament church uh, early on. Man, they're, they're reaching out to the Gentiles now. We know that. Of course, it was the Jew first, the Gentiles receiving the gospel. People are being saved. There's a church up north of Jerusalem and Antioch in Syria that are going to do some really exciting things here that are still continuing to 2018 and should be. But this is the Great Commission. This is not something uh, shocking. This was what Jesus told them to do. And you see the Great Commission, we always quote Matthew chapter right, 28, verse 18 through 20. I'm going to read it to you. You can turn there if you want. You don't have to. But I want you to see that it, it's throughout the Gospels. It's not just something uh, that's here in Matthew 28. It's all over the Bible, actually. But it says, Jesus came and spake unto them. This is before he ascended into heaven here in Matthew. And he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Because of that, he says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even to the end of the world. Amen. I had a guy say to me, how come when you baptize, you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. That's why we do that. Because the Father, Jesus, God, in living flesh, incarnate, and then the Holy Spirit is, is involved in evangelizing and in the Great Commission. So that's why we do that. And, uh, and he says there, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, go ye therefore and teach. That teaches evangelism. The second teach in verse 20 is discipleship. So you get them saved, if they're ready, they're open, you give the gospel, their hearts are open, they receive Christ by faith, baptized into a local body of believers, identification, baptism we know doesn't save, but it's in the New Testament all over the place when a person trusts Christ, it's like they're showing the gospel, kind of like a pantomime, like Red Skelton, remember used to do? By showing you in a public way, I trusted in the death and the burial, and then the resurrection, and of course we go to Romans chapter 6 because it's also symbolizing that they're dying to the old nature and they're raised to walk in newness of life. They're a new creature, right? Mark 16, 15. This is the command in Mark. We're going to go through each and every one here. I want you to see that. I hope you have it marked in your Bible. These are very important commands. These are commands, not suggestions, right? Mark 16, 15. Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world. And what? Preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection to every creature. And then go to Luke 24, toward the end of the gospel of Luke. Luke 24, verse 47. Luke 24 and 47. I'm going to go to 46, all right? Luke 24, 46. 
Again, right near the end there. And he said unto them, this is Jesus, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, the Messiah, right, to suffer, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission, forgiveness of sins, should be preached in his name, where? All nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. They didn't just see it, they were to be witnesses. Some Pastor Sexton used to tell us, you must be a witness of the verb, noun, I'm sorry, before you witness the verb. You must be a witness before you witness. You must be saved. Uh, John chapter 20, we'll look at the Gospel of John. All right, of course, the end, near the end of the book, just go right to the end. 21 is the end, but John 20, verse 21. John 20, verse 21. This is right before Jesus ascended again. It says, Then said Jesus to them again, in verse 21, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath, what? Sent me, even so send I you. That word send there is the word we get the word apostle from. We have no apostles today, eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ, but we have the ministry of an apostle, sent one. As the Father, Apostello, sent me, so send the young. We're still doing that today, right? We're sending. They're going to send tonight, Acts chapter 13, in a minute. Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. Jesus said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And again, they were going in the upper room and waiting, and the Holy Ghost did come in Acts chapter 2. And after that, he said, ye shall be witnesses unto me where? Here in Jerusalem, where they were, in all Judea, the region containing Jerusalem, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, there's no place to stop. Now, Acts chapter 13, and verse 1. It says, now they were in the church that was in Antioch. It's a funny thing that it's not the original meeting place in Jerusalem, but this church in Antioch had many great prophets and preachers there, and God is going to use them in a mighty way. It says there was the church there was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. They are going to name a few here. Barnabas, we know him already. Simeon, that was called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene. Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch. And who else? Saul. Remember, Barnabas went to get Saul from where he was in Tarsus. He thought he'd be perfect for the ministry they're going to begin, which is reaching out as they were commanded. So here's this group. Verse 2 now, they're working in the church in Antioch. Well, you notice, before they sent them to the mission field, they were already busy and active in the church. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul out of that group in verse 1, for the work whereunto I have what? Call them. The ministry is a calling. It's not an occupation where you say, well, you know, when I grow up someday, I want to be a full-time missionary or whatever. No, God calls you. It says they fasted and prayed in verse 3, and then they laid their hands on them. Uh, it was not an adjustment. It wasn't a massage. Right? It was a way of praying, and, and by praying, they were commissioning them to go and do what the Lord sent them to do, what we just read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And they sent them away, and they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. And somebody said to me, well, which is it? Did the church send them, or did the Holy Ghost send them? Both. Amen? <laughs> That's an easy answer. They departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So they left Antioch. Now, last week we said Acts 13 is a pivotal book in the history of the New Testament church. And, and it, it's a hinge on which the other events in, in the book turn. The reason is twofold, and we're going to look at the first of the two reasons. It is a decision to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we must do that to send out what we call today missionaries, all right, from the church, not in Jerusalem, but in Antioch. Antioch, unlike the Jerusalem church, all right, Jerusalem, we know where it is. If you look on a map and look north in Syria, that's where Antioch was. This was the first, not Jerusalem, but the first missionary church to send out people out to go and plant churches was Antioch, first missionary church, not because they had a mission agency there, to train men and women, or they had a, a strategy, a board, like kind of like the board on the back with a map on it, with pins, you know, and, and making many planning and looking over, deciding where they were going to go, and which is not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not against planning. But they didn't do that. They did what they could early on in the church by mostly fasting, praying, and waiting for the Holy Ghost to guide and direct them. You say, well, what, what did they get? A telegram from the Holy Spirit? 
No, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they depended upon the leadership there and the Holy Spirit together to work to send the first missionary team out into this world. And that world back then was the known world, the Roman Empire. Let's look at verse 2 again. It says, while they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and verse 3 says, when they fasted and prayed, they were busy. The people in the church in Antioch were serving the Lord there in that area of Antioch. They had faithful people there in that local church. They were preaching and teaching, winning souls to Christ. All right, and you know, originally they were going out to the synagogues telling the Jews that this Jesus of Nazareth, he was the one that fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecy. He's the Messiah. And many Jews, of course, initially only were getting saved. But now they're reaching to the Gentiles. We talked about how Peter had the, the vision, remember, of the sheet of the unclean animals. And now he went to Simon the Tanner. And from there, Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And, and it's, the church now is it's wide open. And here they're praying about them going out from Antioch into even a different territory than they're comfortable with where they grew up. You understand? They're going to reach out now. And so they're we're working in Antioch. They're working in Jerusalem. They're praying and fasting. And the Holy Ghost says, we're going to call out two men to go and preach the gospel. And they sail to Cyprus. Now, we need to understand that God will call people <laughs> that are faithful where they're at. We, we, uh, when I was in Bible college, we'd say, look, if you're not going to serve the Lord here at the church you're in presently, all right, I was in the church during my college there, Temple Baptist Church was an independent fundamental Baptist church, Pastor Sexton. And they said, look, if you're not busy here doing something, I was involved in nursing home while I was in Bible college, I was involved in soul winning on Monday night uh, and different things like that. And some of the people would say, some of the students would pray and say, I'm seeking God's will. It's not a bad thing to do. It's just that they weren't doing anything. Well, I'm in school. I'm not involved in ministry. I'm too busy studying or whatever. And they'd say, when I get out of here, we're going to go to any location. Some of them want to be missionaries. Some talked about starting a church, planting a church, building a great ministry. You know, And I'd say, if you're not doing anything here, what makes you think you're going to get out of here and go to a place like New York and all of a sudden God's going to, you know, miraculously use you when you're not obeying the simple things here while you're in Bible college? <laughs> this church was busy and God chose these men, prophets and teachers, as they were ministering. Notice where they were at, they were busy and God says, I want to use these men. They, they're excited. They're full of energy. They're full of the Holy Ghost. And they want to do my will. They want to do my work. They want to bring glory to me. All right, so first of all, they were faithful members of that local church, praying and fasting. And while they were busy there in Antioch, God says, now I'm going to take you. You know what he does? He takes the best people. Did you ever go to a church where there's things going on, people being saved, you know, just a good place to be, good preaching, good teaching, good music, everything seems good, and then somebody one Sunday says, Brother so-and-so is going to come up here tonight, and we're going to pray over them, and we're sending them out to the mission field. And, and I used to think when that happened, oh my goodness, this, this is one of the best men in the church. <laughs> this is selfish. We'd say, they're leaving! Uh, uh, God called them. I know I'm happy about that, but, you know, we'd always say, man, these are the best people. They, they do this, they do that. They bring people down the aisle every week. You know, people getting saved. They're out this. I mean, they're just good people, but that's the kind of people God's looking for. And so while they were ministering in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, God's going to steer them in another direction. Remember, Philip was having a great revival in Samaria, and God said, no, you're going to leave there and go to witness this one eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch, which we believe started a great revival eventually in Africa. So we just have to follow God's leading, but, but be busy where you are. And here's the thing. Why were Saul and Barnabas chosen? I don't know. You're going to have to ask God someday, but here's the thing. Barnabas' hometown was Cyprus. All right. Saul and Barnabas, busy in Antioch. <laughs> Somebody said, it's like a car or a boat that cannot be steered in any direction unless they're moving. These men were moving. They were doing things, and God steered them to leave Antioch. I had a sea-do once. It's kind of a, a jet ski kind of thing on the water when I was in Florida. One of my 
uh, members of the Little League, friend of mine, Dennis Connor. He was a patient of mine. Him and his wife and his son became good friends. He had a business that sold these watercraft, you know, and uh, so I was, I was like watching these things on the water. They're faster than any boat. They're, they're jet ski. The, the water, they don't have a propeller. They have a, a propeller inside the motor, and what they do on the bottom, there's a grating. In the bottom, the motor sucks water in and blows it out the back, and that's what propels you. And I'm talking about 50, 60 miles an hour on the water. And me, being a crazy driver that I am, it was kind of like a motorcycle on the water. Oh, we had a lot of fun with that thing. But here's the thing. When you stop blowing the water out, you lose your steering. <laughs> And uh, my son was in the water one day, and I said, I'll be right there to get you. And so I'm going, and the thing stalls out, and it's going towards his head. And I said, duck, duck! And he ducked under the water and uh, didn't crush his skull, thank goodness. But you got to be careful. <laughs> A boat cannot be steered unless you're moving and being propelled. And these men were called from a, a great work in Antioch because God says, we, we're not just going to stay here. We're, the message of the gospel is for the world. We just read all that. The Bible doesn't say exactly how the Holy Spirit spoke to the church here, but it is assumed in those days it said they were in the church in verse 1 in Antioch, prophets, all right? They still had prophets in the church that were preaching under the power of the Holy Spirit. We do that today, but we're talking about the New Testament was unfinished yet. It was still being written in a sense. And so the Lord spoke to the hearts of the leaders in the church. He still does. It's not clear how it was done, but they followed the direction of the church and the Holy Spirit's leading to take two of the best men in the church. And where do they go? Look at verse 4. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed into Seleucia and from thence to Cyprus. Seleucia was a little port city that served Antioch. That's where they were leaving from. And that's where they would get on a boat in Seleucia, right near Antioch, and sail to the island of Cyprus. And again, the question is, why did they go to Cyprus first and not just go north? Where they were already, we're going to go next to Perga and Pamphylia and Antioch and Pisidia. Not the Antioch and Syria, and Syria, but another Antioch. Why go to Cyprus? Again, Cyprus was where Barnabas was from. He probably knew the area very well. I know Jersey City very well. New York has five boroughs, right? Well, Jersey City has five areas too, like the downtown, the Greenville section, all the different areas. How, why do I know it? I was born and raised there. We went to uh, our honeymoon, Kauai, right? Uh, Terry says, I know this place. I was raised here. He knew Cyprus. They wanted to go there. Now, the Cyprus was a major Roman stronghold. All right, another thing. I want to get the gospel there. And third, had a lot of synagogues there. <laughs> These were two men who were familiar, of course, with Judaism. But that's not the only reason. If you, you don't have to turn back to Acts chapter 11, I want you to see what another reason why. Verse 19. Acts eleven nineteen. remember the Bible said this, Now they which were scattered, the Jews, upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. That was back then. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake to the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So here's the thing. Antioch and in Cyprus. There were Jews there from the persecution of Stephen. Or from Pentecost, maybe, when Peter preached and 3,000 Jews were saved, that settled in Cyprus and Antioch. In other words, there was a group of people already there that were saved that could be used to start churches, to, to start assemblies. Of course, they didn't have buildings. We understand the church was the people. These people in these different towns and areas started churches. And they'd have a home base like they had Jerusalem, Antioch, now Cyprus could be another home base with which they could preach the gospel and have a place to stay and meet and the leadership of the church while they were there. And so the Bible mentions another addition to Paul and Barnabas in chapter 13. I want you to look again at verse 4 and then 5. It says, so they in verse 4, who? Paul and Barnabas, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, that's the port city of Antioch, and from thence sailed to Cyprus. And when they were in a town called Salamis, looks like salami to me, which makes me hungry right now, on the east coast of Cyprus, what they do when they get off the boat? Man, these are good men. They preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and somebody's with them, John, to their minister. Oh, they have a, a trio. 
John is also called John Mark elsewhere in the book of Acts, and we know he's the cousin of Barnabas. Did you know that? He was an assistant to Barnabas and Saul on this journey. John Mark's mother was Barnabas's mother's sister. All right, you see the relationship there. Her name was Mary, a very wealthy woman. All right, we'll look back in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. It says, when he considered the thing, Peter, getting out of prison, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Here's John Mark, where many were gathered praying. All right? I get you confused there. This is the same John in Acts 13 that Saul and Barnabas taking as an assistant on the first missionary journey. Do you know how many missionaries since this time to today? Probably not enough today, but because of what happened here, we have a template for, for world missions in the local church. So the same John Mark now joins Saul and Barnabas. This is the home, remember, that Peter came to that we just read about after he was miraculously released from prison. Chapter 12, verse 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. There's many other texts we can go to, even Colossians and 1 Peter, that fill in the blanks about who this John Mark was. In fact, just like when we did with the, the book of Revelation, some theologians think that John Mark is the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and went away sorrowful but was later saved. Again, some believe he was. I don't know for sure. But we do know that he had relatives in Cyprus. So they took him to Cyprus with them, thinking he could be a blessing and a help to the team, right? Okay, back to Acts 13 now and verse 6. Acts 13, 6, when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, which is the west coast of Cyprus, they found (laughs) a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. So right away, listen, when you decide that you're going to do something for the Lord, (laughs) you're going to have opposition. This is opposition right here. They get there. They have John Mark. We have a helper. We're going where we know. We're going to go preach in the synagogue. And here comes a false prophet. Whenever you want to start a new pioneering work like this one, church planting, to get the gospel from now Jerusalem to Antioch, they're going to do finally part of the Great Commission to the uttermost part of the earth. I know this is not the uttermost part of the earth, but for them it might be. And so they're going to go to a city like Cyprus. Here's the thing. The devil is not happy about it. And he's going to do everything in his power to oppose it, to stop it. And the one thing you can expect when you follow the Lord in the area of evangelism, discipleship, uh, ministering in the church, is a direct attack from the devil. Do we know about that? We know about that. You're going to know about that if you do something for the Lord. The last thing the devil wants is for the gospel to spread now to the Gentile world which at this point is a stronghold of Satan at this point. The Jews had the Old Testament and the prophecies and all of of the history. Gentiles, heathen, savages, as far as any kind of spirituality. And so here's Saul and Barnabas on Cyprus, and they encounter this Jew that the Bible calls a false prophet and a sorcerer. The word wizard comes from that. Let's look at verse 6 now again. When they got through the isle to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet a Jew whose name is Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country. His name was Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, listen now, and desired to hear the word of God. So the false prophet is with this Roman, Sergius Paulus, who says, Paul and Barnabas, I'm a little interested here in what you got to say. Let me hear what you got to say. What do you think is going to happen? Did you ever go out witnessing to anybody, talking about the Lord. I don't care whether you're in the store, in a person's home, on the street, in the park. You're witnessing. And things seem to be going good. Be careful. (laughs) That's when the dog will bite your leg. That's when the baby will scream and cry. That's when the guy will get a phone call or a text message and say, excuse me, just in the middle of your God. Did that ever happen to you? Happened to me many times. You know what it is? We'd say it's the devil tickling the baby, making him cry. It's the devil telling the dog, sick him, because <laughs> he wants to stop what you're doing. So here's Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Saul, before a Roman consul who attached himself to this Jewish false prophet in verse 8 called Elymas. Look at that. 
This man calls Paul and Barnabas to, and desires to hear. Look at verse 8. But Elymas, again, Bar-Jesus, the sorcerer, this is his name by interpretation, it says, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy, Sergius Paulus, from the faith. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Sergius Paulus, interested in hearing the word of God, and here the guy with him, the Jewish sorcerer, tried to turn him away. Don't listen to them. How many times, again, have you tried to do that and things interrupt you? They oppose you. It's a demon. It's satanically inspired, I can tell you that. I told you about the guy down in the hospital in Miami that we were there visiting a friend of ours, and the guy next to him said, I want to hear what you have to say about Jesus. I, I need to get saved. And we started to pray with him, and he started to shake. Remember the story I told you? He ran out of the room. We looked at each other like, this guy's cuckoo. I'm, I'm kind of glad he left because he was starting to scare me, this guy, the way he shook and everything. and things. I never saw anything like that before. He comes back in the room, the same guy before we left, and said, there's something inside me that, that made me run out of the room. Now I really know he's crazy, and he goes, but I want to hear what you have to say. And so we said, oh, we're going to tell you about Christ, that you need to be saved. So I got, you know, I'm like 300 pounds. I put my body on the man's body, and he wasn't moving. I don't care what happened. And we went through the plan of salvation. He prayed and got saved, this guy in this mental hospital that my friend Pete was in. We left after that. The guy was nice. Was goodbye, Pete. We were leaving anyway when this happened. So we did leave. Next day I called Pete. Huh, tell me about the guy, the guy that was shaken yesterday that finally heard the gospel. He said he was in bed this morning reading his Bible and calm as, as a cucumber. <laughs> It's like the, the, de the demon-possessed man of Gadara, right? He's clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's what I thought of. Does that happen all the time? No, it doesn't. But Satan will use situations and things, and here he's using a Jew, and while well, these two Jews are witnessing to this Roman. Look at how Barnabas and Saul react. I don't know if you would do this, or even I would do this. Verse 9, Then Saul, who's also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, on this Elymas, Bar-Jesus character. In other words, I think he gave him the eye. Ever hear somebody's giving me the eye, they call it? It's like, Terry has these eyebrows that are kind of like the rock. You know, one side goes up, I can't do that. When she looks at me like that, I'm so much bigger than her and stronger, but I start to get nervous and sweat and shake. <laughs> anyway... This Paul put his eye on him. <laughs> now, listen. Jesus has been very kind and loving when it comes to dealing with different groups of people. He always had that love and that heart of love because God is love. <laughs> Wait a minute. Jesus wasn't always that way, all right? When he went and turned over the, the money changers' tables and, and beat them with a whip and says, you've made the house, which is a house of prayer, a den of thieves. You remember that? Same, same Jesus, right? Here's the thing. They're not just talking to somebody. They're talking to a man, which is one of the reasons they went to Cyprus, because it was a Roman stronghold, and this man called for them. It's like somebody coming up to you and say, what must I do to be saved? And you're going to say it, and somebody says, wait, be quiet. Don't talk to him about Christ. That's what this guy did. So Paul puts his eyes on him. And whenever someone deliberately stands between God and a seeking soul, uh, I think we're going to be a little different on how nice we are to them. Look at verse 10 now. What does Paul, Saul, say? Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, he says to him. You child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, he said, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. <laughs> Say, who did that, Paul? Yeah, God worked through Paul by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's who did that. What an object lesson here for this Roman consul, Sergius Paulus. If he was ever wondering who God is, he doesn't have to wonder any longer. Look at verse 12. Then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw it was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, I don't believe he was astonished just at the miracle of the blind to this uh, sorcerer, this false 
prophet, I believe because of the doctrine, the gospel. He heard the gospel. He was interested. He was a seeker. It all took care of that false prophet. And now this guy was ready to be saved. And it says he believed. He was astonished at the doctrine. Look at verse 13. They're going to go on from here. And I want you to say and see and understand that if you serve the Lord, what if we went to all lost people and said, I want you to get saved. Everything's going to be great. You're going to get a lot of money. You're going to be wealthy and you're never going to get sick. We'd be lying to them. Because when you decide you're going to serve the Lord and get involved, all kinds of things. Is it only bad things? No. If I was going to tell you the Christian life is a great life, I'd say yes, it is. But there are things that happen in your life that God does and allows to happen to you so that you can be more like Christ. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. When you go through things and trials, the Bible says if for a season, if it doesn't last forever. And here's the thing, like Paul said, he prayed for the thorn in his flesh. What happened? God said, no, I'm not taking it from you. So what did he do? He gave him his grace. I said, my grace is sufficient. And I could say, and you know, those of you that have been here, that have been through trials in your life, God's grace is sufficient. Amen. And so I just want you to know, though, these things happen. Pastor Hopper has been in the ministry longer than I've been alive. He will tell you, I guarantee, that things happen. When he went to the Philippines last year, he broke his leg, right, his ankle. Did he want that to happen? No. But you know what? When he was here recently, infection in his leg. Does he want to go to the hospital and have an infection? No! But he'll tell you, and he told me, he's in the hospital, he's got people there that he witnesses to. God uses even bad situations like that for his glory. Amen? Just expect it. Just expect it. You may not win somebody to Christ by telling them, well, once you get saved, that's when the real problems start. You say you wouldn't say it like that. I wouldn't either. But you got to let people know as the part of their discipleship, things are going to happen in their lives. But all things work together, Romans 8, 28, for good. Do you believe that? I believe it. Verse 13 now. Now when Paul and his company, <laughs> sounds like he has a big business going there. Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark, they loosed from Paphos. It said they came to Perga and Pamphylia, which is on the northern part of Cyprus. And John, wait a minute, what happens here? John Mark departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. What happened with him? Now, Luke doesn't tell, we believe is the writer of Acts, why John Mark would leave his cousin Barnabas and Saul, suddenly return home. You don't understand until Acts 15, which we're not doing tonight. You're going to find out what Paul thinks about this, about John Mark leaving and going back to Jerusalem. And if, I'm going to read Acts 15, 36 just for a second, just to see. Then again, this is at a later date. It says, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again, another missionary trip, and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord. See how they do. This is what missionaries do when they say they're going on deputation first. They get their support raised. They go out to the mission field. Then they come home on furlough. You ever hear that word furlough? And they visit churches. And then they go back again to the mission field. Well, they were going to go back a second time to visit where they had started churches to see how things are going. And Barnabas determined to take his nephew with him there. John, whose surname was Mark. I mean, I'm sorry, his cousin. But Paul thought it not good. He was against it to take him with them. Why? He left them when they were in Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Listen to this now. And the contention was so sharp between who? Paul and Barnabas. Kind of like Martin and Lewis <laughs> breaking up. This team. The contention was so sharp like Abbott and Costello breaking up. No, not really. But the contention was so sharp, they departed asunder, one from the... About what? About taking John Mark. That was their argument. And they sailed unto Cyprus. Barnabas took Mark and said, he's coming with me. He's related to me. And he's good. And they went to his home island. And Paul says, what am I going to do? Well, he chose Silas. So you know, it actually worked out better. Instead of one missionary team, they have two teams. Barnabas and Mark, who you never hear of again, by the way, and Paul and Silas. They depart 
being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. What they originally planned to do, he did. All right? So what did Paul think of John Mark? A deserter, <laughs> a quitter, who would not come along on the second trip. And there's several theories given for John Mark leaving. One, homesick. <laughs> he was young. Two, he resented the change in leadership from his cousin Barnabas, now to Saul, being the leader of the group. Three, some people believe he came ill. Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. Four, he wasn't able to withstand the rigors of mission work. You're going to see in a minute where they were going to as a mountainous region that was very rough. In other words, he was too soft. Number five, he may have never planned on going all the way in the first place and just wanted to go part of the way and never communicated that to Paul and Barnabas. Now he's ready to go back home. These are five possibilities. And before we get too hard on John Mark, remember, they were going to go through Pamphylia. It's called the Taurus Mountains. It was very rugged, dangerous, treacherous. Paul himself mentioned later, he came upon, remember, perils and robbers, perils in the wilderness, perils by the heathen. It would be like going through the mountains of Afghanistan with a t-shirt on that said, down with Islam. It'd be like doing that, <laughs> going through these mountains to a young man that maybe wasn't up to task. We believe that, possibly. But whatever it was that turned him back from the missionary tour, Paul looked on his excuses as weak and not to be trusted, so much so that they had a sharp contention between him and, and Barnabas. So they separated. Barnabas, remember, originally was the one that took Saul under his wing and helped him when he went to Jerusalem because they said, Saul's a Christian? The one that killed Jewish believers? Yes, he took him. He's, I'm telling you. And when he saw... The, the zeal and, and, the, and the willingness for Saul to go out and preach to the Jews. They said, maybe he's right. Barnabas, remember, he was also right about John Mark. Saul was wrong here. <laughs> because even later, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, 20 years later, Paul asks for John Mark to come. Remember, he says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark, bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. Well, we believe God is the God of second chances, amen? Third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances. Barnabas, great man, he's never heard of again. You know who's heard of throughout the rest of the, most of the New Testament? Paul. Paul realizes, though, that he, John Mark, was profitable and was big enough to admit it. And he's profitable as well today because someday he would write the Gospel of Mark. We may not have a book with his name on it here, but Barnabas is all over the book of Acts. And there wouldn't be a Paul if he didn't take that Jewish Saul, that Pharisee aside, and bring him to the apostles in Jerusalem. We might not have a Gospel of Mark. And we wouldn't have Paul asking for John Mark later in his life because he's profitable if it wasn't for the humble servant named Barnabas. Barnabas' name was J-O-S-E-S, Joseph. He didn't give up on people. That word means son of encouragement. You ever meet somebody like that? That every time you're around them, it's upbeat and positive, even if they're going through tough times. Some people, no matter what happens, the Lord's with them. They know it, and they can go through tough times and still smile and still be an encouragement. We need people like that today, amen? God uses all kinds of people in his work. You see that here. In Acts chapter 13, from Jew to Gentile, he uses them. From learned scholars to uneducated fishermen. From kings to peasants. To proclaim the good news that Jesus saves. Amen? All of us different. We're going to see uh, when we study Corinthians later on about how Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, compares the church to a body. With the body of Christ, we have different parts, but all one. We're all one in our service to the Lord. We have to understand that it's not our work. It's not our church, even though we say, yeah, it's our church. I go to Bethel Bible Church. It's the Lord's. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build your church. Jesus didn't say, you will build my church. He said, I will build my church. We're all servants. He uses an Italian-American from Jersey City to preach the gospel. He uses a Filipino woman to marry that Italian 
so she can encourage him to be a good husband and a good pastor. God uses all people. I always say to Terry, I can't believe it. Smack me. She doesn't smack me. She wants to. But she's so nice. She's not like me. <laughs> I say, I still can't believe I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> that I'm here and we're in Wahiwa. We're having Cy Min and, and we're married. And me from New Jersey, of all places. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? God's uh, good to us. Think of your own life. Some of the times I think of the decisions I made in my life, that what if I made the other decision? What, you know, what if I didn't do this and I did that instead? Where would you be today? We can't look back and think that way, but sometimes we do. God uses us as we are usable. We said God's looking for a lot of fat people. So wait a minute now, don't get upset. I'm not calling anybody fat here. F-A-T is faithful, available, and teachable. God wants to use us. We want to be fat Christians. Amen? We love fat people. <laughs> God does too. But let's pray and ask the Lord to help us be a church like that Antioch church. November, we're going to have a missions emphasis month. We want to see what God would have us to do even more than we're doing now. We're doing great things now. We want to do even more for missions. No way to stop. As long as God's blessing, it's like you get on the train and you go with it. You go on a wave. You ever body surf? You wait for that big wave. Sometimes you say, ah, I'll wait for the next one. And you think there's a good wave and it dies out all of a sudden. But here it comes and you get it and you go right and that takes you all the way to the shore and you scrape your chest in the sand. But you know what? It was a fun ride. <laughs> we have to get on with the Lord. It's his work. Whether we get on or not, he's going forward. I want to be on that wave. I want to be with him. And I want to see him bless the work here and all over the world because of Again, no perfect people, but our faithfulness to him and his word. So he gets the glory for it all, not us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this New Testament church, especially now Antioch spreading out even to Cyprus and other areas that, Lord, you, you even use the contention between Saul and Barnabas to start two missionary teams now. And, Lord, it worked out ultimately for the good. John Mark was later restored to fellowship with Paul and we worked all these things out. And Lord, as we uh, look at this, help us to be excited about what you're doing here in 2018 as well. Help us to be obedient where we are. Use us here in this place to bring glory to you. We will thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All God's people said, amen. amen. All right. We're dismissed.